This video is being recorded for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. The veteran's name is Ray Fox. Uh, Ray was in the 101st Airborne in World War II. He participated in Operation Market Garden and the Battle of the Bulge. I'm Will Hines and recording this interview. Uh, no relation. So, Mr. Ray, can, where did you grow up and where are you initially from? What now? Where did you grow up and where are you initially from? Manetta. Little town down here, about six miles off off, off Highway One. Uh huh. And so you grew up during the Great I Depression. Grew up right now in Aiken County, yeah. Uh, between here and Aiken, mm -hmm. you know where Aiken is. Oh yeah. Well, my daughter, I grew up there. And when I went in service, I was in, living in my daughter. Okay. But when, when I came out of service, I got married and bought a house here in Batesburg. Okay. So you grew up, were your family farmers? Did you guys have land and did you farm? Um, or what was it like growing we, up in the Depression? We were what you call tenant farmers. Mm -hmm. Well, we first, uh, we, at one time, we were on grandfather's place and he had about 12 acres of asparagus. I can't remember holding asparagus into the packing house when I was probably 11 years old. <laughs> had a meal full of ground slide with two boxes on it. Asparagus, you know, is built up on a bed. I don't know where you know it. It's a good about six, eight feet apart. You cut the asparagus that you cut, the cutters do it, and, and when you got a handful, they lay it up on top of the bed. I goes along with the mule, pick that up, and put it in a box, and take it to the packing house. My uncle paid me six cents a day uh, back for your time. Yep. Fifth cents a day is what, is what they made. Wow. To plow a meal all day long. So. Wow. So, what was it like growing up in the Depression? Did you know that the economy was in bad shape, or was it just I life did. as usual? I did. That's when I quit school and went to Columbia when I was 16 years old. I had five brothers. We lived down in grandfather's place, no rent, but it was hard for my dad, father worked on the WPA. You don't know what that, we, we used to tease them, let's say we call them, we poke around, which they did, you know. They'd go through the country trying and build outhouses for people and build their parks or whatever. Was that like the CCC? Is the uh, at that time we had the CCC. Yeah. Like all our parts in South Carolina, 95% of them has been built by CCC. Yep. Yeah. That's cool. So, what? So you you dropped out of school, and when when the war when the war was going on, so when World War II was going on, um, but you, the U.S. wasn't involved. Uh, did you did you really think about the the worldwide war going on? What were your thoughts on that uh, while you were living here? I tell you what changed me. I had a deferment form, what they call a form deferment. I, I didn't have to go. Uh, I, I'd sign up, but there was a company in the Red Spring hauling peaches had. They had two trucks from Winter Haven, Florida. I'll never forget the Sipes Motor Company. I didn't even know the name of it. One of the drivers got sick, and his manager came and asked me would I drive for him the rest of the summer. As then, the trucks that hauled produce followed the climate. Started off at Florida, and then the Peachy Chair, and then going up North, North Carolina with all corn. And even up far as New Jersey, the whole strawberries. Uh, uh, even I hold some ice cream down to Paris Island one time from Washington. I left, uh, he asked me what I'd drive. I said, yeah, I'll drive for you. I got that pulling this truck to trail it with a real GMC with a sleep in it. It was a nice, nice outfit. Every time I'd pull into an army camp, you know, you'd back up to the warehouse and they'd check it, temperature or whatever, you know, and 
I could go up there and take a nap. They would unload. There was no hurry. I got to seeing all these soldiers about my age or a little older. I said, I need to be in service. I don't need to be doing this. I got back to Washington off, off of that trip that I got really thinking about it. And told the boss, I'm, I said, I'm going to fix the joint service. He said, well, thank you. He paid me what he, what he owed me. And he said, I appreciate you helping us out. I said, well, I came back home and called a bus to Fort Jackson and joined the service. And what year was that? 43. 43. So when Pearl Harbor was attacked two years before, you know, what was going through your mind? Do you remember where you were and, and what you thought? You remember in Pearl Harbor? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was, I was living in, in, in Manetta, and uh, my thoughts, yeah, was very serious of thinking of what was going to happen to the country. I tell you what, this virus is similar to the Great Depression. Mm. And we're going to come out, come out of it. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely thinking about the people that's going to die or have already died, but I fought and almost, I tell some of the people, I said, the German tried to kill me. Now the damn virus is trying to kill me. The Chinese now is trying to kill me. I said, but the good Lord is not ready for me. That's right. So. That's right. So. I, I, yeah, I went to Fort, Fort Jackson. I was shot at that. I said, anybody want to join the paratroopers? Me and a couple more held up all my hands. For, I, I, I'd heard we was going to the infantry, and I really didn't, you know, I didn't realize the parachute was after you got on the ground, you're the infantry. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the parachute, it just gets you now. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so what? So what? I, made, what made you? I mean, what made you enlist in the paratroopers? Was it the the experience? It, 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 I didn't want to serve in the infantry. That's what I first thought. Besides, it paid an extra fifty dollars a month. I was gonna say well, that the pay was higher, right? Well, yeah. Once you were, you know, but you had to go through. You had to be a parachute before it would start. Right. So. What so you went you went to Fort Jackson you enlisted you joined the paratroopers where did you go to uh, jump school at jump training and and what was that, all your training? Let's call it let's go to infantry training first. I went to Tyler, Texas, seventeen weeks. Now they do it what eight weeks? <laughs> yeah, it's been cut back. But now I had all all top seventeen weeks. All right, when I left Tyler, Texas. Camp Fanning was the name of the infantry training camp. Camp Fanning at High Tyler, Texas. Yeah. They put me on a train and sent me to Fort Benning for five weeks. And was that was that, that your jump training? Was that it, jump training. And your first two weeks is nothing but physical, which I didn't. Hell, I'd been trained for 17 weeks, and I was the only fellow I could. A lot of time, well, almost, they say we run five miles before breakfast, but I don't think it was five miles. For two weeks, then we had jumping out of towers, uh, not jumping out of towers, the chutes already open, just floating down, and, and besides, we packed our own chutes at <laughs> night. Two of you would go down to the hangars and get your chute and spread it out on the table, and Fold it up and show it up, and you know. All it. Wow. So, what what was your first jump like? Were you scared? Were you fearful jumping out of that airplane? Not really. Uh, I was a little fearful, yeah, about getting out of the door. But you don't you don't stop in the door. If you stop, you'll get a foot up your ass. <laughs> 
way out there. All, all they do is jump them out that's pushing you out. <laughs> so you can't, you can't hesitate. Yep. If you do, you know, the last, well, seven, 17 men is always jumped back then out of C-47. Mm-hmm. And how long did it take to get those 17 men out? Huh? How long did it take to get the 17 out the door? They tried to do it with less than 15 seconds. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. Yes. So... 17 men and... And I think most time they did, but you didn't, you know, it would just, they'd be running out of the drop zone and, and there'd be, be trees or rivers or whatever. We we took off in Georgia and that and, and ended up in Alabama. <laughs> Fort Benning is uh, the what is it, Chattahoochee River, mm -hmm. I believe. Is that right? I yeah. think so. We, then they take us back across the river in boats back to the post. Wow. So, how was what what weaponry did you learn when you're training? So during your training, were you using the old Springfield 1903s? Uh, we had a few. You only had a few. Yeah, but most of most of them won. Okay. So. But they, you know, they took the same ammunition. Mm-hmm. And, and neither one of them, you know, it was took a semi-automatic. People say, well, they were automatic. No, they wasn't automatic. Automatic rifle, as you know, once you pull the trigger and don't turn the trigger loose. Back then, we had very few automatic guns. And the German had a whack axe, I don't know what they called it. It was shot so fast, you couldn't hold it down, so if he missed you, if he didn't hit you the first couple of shots, the thing would ride up, you didn't worry about it. The, the MP40, are you, are you talking about the MP40, the, the black little machine gun with the folding stock? Machine gun with yeah, machine gun was automatic. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so, what was a automatic rifle we had? A short barrel, had a long clip. The Thompson, the Thompson submachine gun. Uh, no, it, yeah, we had Thompson, but I'm talking about the. The infantry that carried, I mean, the men that carried this, uh... The BAR? Or the, the... Oh, BAR. That's a, that's a heavy, uh, mm -hmm. that's something similar to a machine gun, except one man can can shoot it. Yeah. Right in automatic, I, I shot, I, I shot it. So, tell me about, so you, you finish your training, and you're going to ship over to England. Can you talk about where you shipped out of and the journey over to England? When I left uh, Fort Benning, I got a 10-day fur delayed furlough. And I was supposed to check in at Fort Meade, Maryland. That's where they refurnish you all your equipment. All your clothes. I remember he might have some boots that I really broke down. They wouldn't. They wouldn't let me keep them. They had to, I had to have new ones. After I left Fort Meade, we went over to Camp Shanks, New York. I don't know. That, that's where the ship was, uh, was loaded. Loading. It's a. I never heard of it. Never saw it on the map. I don't know what. It's probably, probably New York, where it's like right on the, at the harbor, and they—that's where we, I got on the ship to go to England. And what ship did you take over to England? Queen Elizabeth. Okay. We had, I believe, it was twenty-six thousand troops. It was. It used to be a. a a cruise ship, you know, but they'd made the room smaller and put, I think we had eight, eight people to the room. And you slept in room one night and up on the deck the next right. 
but I happened to be fly away just a private, but I was in charge of my room. So I got to stay in the room every night, but I'd, I'd really rather sleep out on the deck, but you know, it was cooler. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, that's, so you, you boarded, you boarded the, the ship on June 1st, 1944, that's what I just read, so you, you boarded June 1st. Did you know of the coming invasion of, of Normandy? Did no. you, were you trained and, and taught a lot of what's going on, or was it kept quiet? Nobody knew about it. After we got off, oh yeah, when we got on the ship, they tell you right away, if you fall over the water, we will not stop. You know, it takes that ship, what, a couple miles to stop. <laughs> well, besides, the German submarines at that time was everywhere. But, as you know, maybe you, it takes a submarine, a, a torpedo a long time to get to a ship. And we ran a zigzag course. You run three minutes that way and then three minutes that way. That's to keep the, keep the torpedoes from, if they, if they pick the ship up. And it ran uh, 28 knots. That's about 35 miles an hour. It wasn't, wasn't nothing to keep up with it. So we ran along. Five days we were in Scotland. Five days of night. Wow, that's awesome. So, and when we got to Scotland, the ship actually couldn't dock at the har at the loading, unloading dock or whatever in the harbor. It had to dock, dock out in the ocean because it so it carried the underwater, you know, so much. It, the water was too shallow, and they took us off in small boats by using the rope the ladder down the side and you just, you know, climbed down the ladder and got on the small boat and they took us down to Newbury, England. And we heard all the news down the invasion was on. And I got to thinking, I said, my gracious, they're going to right, they're going to send us an in invasion with, with not even a rifle. And, and we, I went in as a replacement. The hunter first was only going about five, Seven weeks, no, yeah, eight, seven or eight weeks. They were sent back to England, and I went in as a replacement and trained with them until we went into Holland in September. So they, so was there any animosity? I'm um, not any animosity, but was there? any dislike because you were a replacement? Did you did you have a tough time fitting in with the guys yeah, initially? Yeah. To start with. <coughs> but they quickly found out that I was an old southern boy and I was raised with a bunch, and a bunch of well brothers. And I was just as damn rough as they was. <laughs> and they found out right away that I knew how well that you could look them reckon so I you know, use all kind of weapons and training at at uh, at uh, Texas. So yeah, a lot of a few of the New York guys we well, yeah, they they wanna be a smart ass but uh Yeah. Did, yeah, yeah, so but, they did you did you talk to them? Did they tell you much about combat? Did they cause they uh, they didn't? No. We didn't. All they would did talk about is getting in a fight with the 82nd. I think we, they fought the 82nd Airborne Division more than they did the Germans in England. We, 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 I think we were stationed not too far apart. And, <laughs> but the 101st at that time was kind of a new division. And they found out real quick that it was it was a very good division. A lot of trained men that knew what they was doing, and not a lot of back talk. That remember don't always. If you say yes or no, sir, and 
and do what they ask you to do, you will not get in trouble. I know I've gotten in trouble a couple of times. <laughs> I got caught at the PX one time. And I put it and got put on washing and then, of course back then we washed we 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 done the cooking. Well the infantry done the we had cooks, you know, just <laughs> so I got caught down in the PX, man, and my buddy and we got uh On KP for that weekend, <laughs> I washed pots and pans. I think and been that big old, you know, thirty gallons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so you're you're in England. You're a replacement. Um, you were assigned a weapon at that point. Were you assigned a weapon at that point? Not at that point. I didn't assign a weapon to. The outfit got back from Normandy because they didn't know where to put you. They didn't know how many men they were going to lose or how many they going to get back. Mm -hmm. So you were, you were called into the captain's office and maybe he asked you a couple, few questions and then he would, they, the sergeant would assign you where to go. So where what were you assigned? Were you a, a rifleman? Were you I was assigned a mortar assistant gunner to start with. And and after we didn't have a mortar tube and hollow uh, they they changed me to rifleman, so I did my whole whole, whole service in the war with a rifleman. So I was a. Uh, I got called on a few times to, while we were advancing. We were dead down low out in the hollow, and the best time we didn't. Getting ahead of myself, the best time we just dug in. We were on the defense. As you know, if you dig a hole like John, and you can shoot at me half a day, and you, as long as I keep my head, as long as I stay down in, that, in the ground, hang on, bother me. Even a uh, mortar shell or any kind of shell has got to get right close to you to even hurt you. But as a rifleman, as we were advancing, and like we did a lot in Holland, and sometimes we we retreated. We don't. I don't say we advanced all the time. We had to retreat a few times in Holland, but we were there 73 days. So that was over to about two and a half. Well, and I can remember particularly two or three times the machine gun had us hold up the German the sergeant would ask me to. If we had a old a house, anything where I could get get up in a, a distance, and they pick up that gun, he said, "Once you pick it up, make sure you've got some traces." People say, "Well, traces you, you can you can see it you can see it in the daytime. You can't see it in the daytime as good as you can at night." Mm -hmm. But I knew there were two. The last time he asked me to do this. Just before I was wounded, I told Fennel, that was my fox old buddy, he said, take Fennel and go up another house and see can you pick up that machine gun. I said, Mate, once you pick him up, make sure you got some treasure where we can see where the fire is coming from. I told Fennel, I, I knew there were two German tanks out there, but they'd already knocked out. A, 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 we, we had British tanks. Uh, uh, support. It already knocked out a couple of the British tanks. I told Phil, I said, you take them turn, them traces out of them clips. I, I picked them up right away. I shot a few shots so I know uh, Well, when we, we, we advanced right after that, he's the only thing to hold us up, that gun. 
And I found one dead German, so I, I don't know, I thought I'd maybe hit more than that, but there was one dead one. They didn't, they left his body there. They didn't took, took the body with them. I don't think they had time. Mm. My sergeant wanted to know why. <laughs> I didn't use traces. I said there wasn't no traces in the clips. I lied. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe Fennel told him that I made him take the traces out. Not, he said, I'll see you when we get back to the rest camp. <laughs> so, but, but I was wounded before I got back to the rest camp. I, I not, didn't see him no more. So, <laughs> <laughs> so go, going back to the beginning of Market Garden, so you're loading up planes in England and you fly to Holland and you guys have what was your objective was it to capture some bridges they called it Hell Highway I got a book and I wish y'all would read it uh, we got the hunt on first airborne and the 82nd airborne in Holland scattered out upside of the Nile River the British it was a main road that ran parallel to the river. We had English or the British artillery yeah, tank. We supposed to keep that highway clear for them tanks to come through. As quick as they got up to the Arden or Arden or where the bridge too far. That's where we were going across the big steel bridge. We was going to ride the tanks from there to Berlin. The war would, would have been over just, you know, earlier. The British jumped, the first British airborne jumped in Germany, right, right on the other side of the Rhine River. And we was on the, the uh, Holland side, the 101st and 82nd. Just scattered out the plane, you know, would drop a, uh, a couple of loads here, a couple of loads there, and we just had, you know, a small town to take. And we kept that. And so the British had the, the bridge under control. Then they went, the German ran them, it got too thick for them, and the German took over the tank bridge and went down and blew it. So when the tanks come on through, when they got up there, we had, they had no bridge across the river. So the three divisions and two and a half months of fighting was to no, really no advantage. Now we did run the Germans out of Holland. They had been there for three years, they had control, and the people were so happy. Mm. We ran them, well, we didn't kill or capture, we ran them across the river. I know the, the English newspaper said they, they came down like angels from heaven. Yeah, yeah. And, but they found, the Germans found out right quick we weren't no angels, so. <laughs> and, so can you, can you talk about the combat in those little towns? You said you would have to go take those little towns. Was it... What was the strategy, and was it fierce they, combat? They, was it close would, quarters? They would tell you everything they knew. They would help you or feed you or give you, well, what? Most people would, well, no, that was best on. They, they, and there was one instance in Holland that we ran this. Germans out of this small town, I can't remember the name of it. The nun from this Catholic church invited my company. We we one took well to come down to the church and have potato soup. They made us potato soup and oh I, it was really good, you know. We, we, we stacked our rifles out in the church. And then the German advance started to come back to take the town, and it got too hot for us. We had to leave. 
and they almost, I think some of them cried, and none said they, if they found out we fed you, they'll kill us, which they probably did. But within a week or two, we went back and took the town and drove the German further away, and found out that they, they didn't bother the nuns. The German didn't. They didn't even find out about it. I didn't didn't bother them for feeding us. And uh, that's when I, I I don't have that in my me and two more was on guard of this church, and there was about a three foot brick fence. Around, around church next to the highway. Mm. We just laying out one night and I heard a motorcycle coming. Why that German was out riding a motorcycle at night, I don't know. We shot him off the motorcycle. Of course, it went all around the building and crashed. I can still hear that German morning about four three or four o'clock in the morning. I heard him, he just kept moaning for, well, help, like, you know, somebody crying for help. I told the two of both soldiers, I said, well, no way, just wait till it gets daylight. We, we're not going to there might be a trap. Daylight came, we let the medics, the medics went over and put them on the truck and took him out. I don't know where he lived or not, but he was shot. Hmm. And he was in a telephone booth, like Southern Bell years ago used to have the telephone booth up by, you know, put different place. And I never forget, he rode up on that wall, blood hand, and that's all it was, his blood hand. I doubt he had, was bleeding and he took his finger and wrote blood hand. So I don't know where he lived or not, but <laughs> the next, Next morning, yeah, pretty early. It was, they didn't remove this German. We looked down the street, and here come this German tank with about, I don't know, 25, 30 infantry marching on each side of it. I really think they was hunting that motorcycle to realize he, you know, he, he, he probably was out to get some information or something. I told the two boys, I said, wait till that tank. Wait, wait till get, they get in the range and I'll let you know. And we had knocked some of them soldiers out, and we did. I, I waited, we waited. Till they got uh, a couple hundred yards. We opened fire, and I don't know how many were knocked down, but there was a lot of blood on the highway. The tank stopped and turned around and they left. But <laughs> that tank fired one shell, and we were down behind that wall, and he, he didn't know exactly where we, we were shooting from. That shell hit down below us, I had that wall, and it blowed brick everywhere. And that one time, me and the two boys took off. Well, we crawled down behind the wall until we got some building and took off. <laughs> and got a bazooka man to come up. To, but the tank had already turned around and left, so. So how, how intimidating was the German tank, the, the Tiger tank? Well, we didn't have nothing to, to knock it out, so we, I was always up with Always what I was afraid of, of a tank. But he'd come close to your fox hole and he'd throw a grenade down in it. And a, a, a shell or a bum, you know, coming from a, one of the bummers. And... So was that your closest call with a tank? That story? No, I had, I had one in... Trying to think what it was. I'm sure it'll come to you. 
It was in Holland. It is. See some bluebird and going in and out of the house. Good. Yeah. Must be building a well. What? Uh, we was on one side of the dikes, and the Germans was on the other side. They kept throwing grenades of my of men. I, I wasn't involved in that. And the grenade would always roll down to the bottom and pull, bang, it would go off. So they're going to be real smart. They took some parachute uh, lines, uh, the lines that went up from your harness to the chute. They shrunk us. Tied my gallon and hooked the grenade to it. It threw it over the dike. It was rolled, rolled up on top of the dike. Throw it over the dike. The German what happened? They was they was dug in up up you know up on the in the side of the dike, not at the bottom. And that's it. Then the grenade would go off. All right. They, one grenade. We had British artillery observers. They was up on top of the dock and almost went rolled back in their hole because he didn't throw it all the way over. So the lieutenant put out the captain, I think he was the captain, put a stop to that right away. Uh, within the next day, me and Fennel, that was my foxhole buddy, uh, Saw this tank come out from under that dike where, where the road was uh, kind of a bad out like and, and a railroad truss on top. But when he come out there, he stopped. And that was a mistake he made. Fennel wanted to run. I said, no, if we got to run, he'll kill us. We, we, were, uh, we were close to me like damn from the, to him. Uh, yeah. At least, and probably closer. So, I noticed down below me uh, there were a couple, three men, and I saw that what a bazooka. Uh, somebody had told him the tank had come through. And all of a sudden, the side of that tank exploded. And I don't know how many Germans came out of it, but we, I know we, ki we killed them all fast. They come out, and it was, it was four or five. Come to find out there were two more tanks behind it. If that tank would have come on through, it would have wiped us all out. The other two tanks turned out to turn around and left. And, but the fighting was almost over at that time, and most of the Germans had been drove back across the river back into Germany. Hmm. So were you wounded in yeah. Holland? And, and what uh, happened? Well, the worst fight was in Bastogne, but I wasn't wounded in Bastogne. I'll tell you about Christmas Day before, before we get on to where I was wounded, if it's all right. Yeah. You pulled two weeks on the front line and one week in reserve. My platoon was in reserve. That morning I was standing where we I had to keep a guard out. That morning I was on guard. Christmas day of 40th. Christmas day of 44th. I saw this farmer down in this past. I thought he was a farmer waving a coat. The little cattle shack there, about close me to that cabin. I said, well, I won't, I said to myself, oh, I, don't, I won't shoot him. I'll just stand up by, by a house. We, we spent the night that night in a, in a house that the people had moved in. You can use their beds, anything you want to, but don't take nothing. Uh, uh, and the rest of us in there sleep. Uh, Whatever. He waved that coat, and I said, well, I won't shoot him. I thought he was a farmer. So I took my rifle and bang and shot through the cabin. Out come 16 Germans with their hands, hands over their head. 
They had broke through all the line. I think they wanted to surround Gonzales. They had come through all the line, main lines at night, and they were trying to, really they were trying to surround us. I don't know why he was waving a coat to tell her he should have had a white flag or whatever. He's damn lucky I didn't shoot him. But, uh, but as I was marching him up, I hollered for help. One of the German pointed down in the snow, and there was two pistols. A P-38 on a Italian Beretta, a Italian Beretta was on a company, I was, I was old symbol, 20, 25 pistol. I picked them up and took them up. We, we searched them and <clears throat> took anything off on it. You know, we wanted, to, we didn't want them to have them. The MPs took them, you know, took them on as prisoners. Um, That was in the hollow, and then we went back to yeah, right after we went back to a rest camp. And we were back in somewhere in, in, in uh, France. And I was lucky again, I was still just a, P, a PFC, we all made PFC. <laughs> I was one of the first one that got a pass from my platoon to a three-day pass to Paris. And wow, now I had volunteered on some patrols. I'll tell you about them if you want. Yeah. I volunteered me and seven motocross the Rhine River to try to capture a German. That German outpost was on the other side. We went across that in two, two rubber bolts, four and each one. Then we got on on the other bank. We got out and crawled through the grass, through the swamp grass, to where the outpost was. They wasn't there. So, but and all of us, they gave all of us. I didn't have that with us. What was it? Was it? I was trying to think. It wasn't it? Tommy Gun. Yeah, they give all us, all, all eight of us automatic weapons to, to you know, just took them from the other boys and, get, and let us scare them on that patrol. And we went on one more patrol, but we know they captured the German. Uh, we, I uh, didn't get back when we left. Holland. Yeah, on, on, on the pass, I got I got a three-day pass to, to, to go to. What did What did you do in Paris while you were there? Drink champagne, got drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good time. Hell yeah, out this nightclub and this little girl wasn't sitting over. I think she was sitting by the table. Come over and sit by me. She saw I had the hiccups or something. I read it in mind if I was on the way. She took me home with her. I don't mind tell you that. In addition to her parents, she said, I spent the night with her and that's what I sex a couple of times or whatever. Next morning, she didn't want me to leave. I said, no, if I don't, if, if I stay with, she wanted me to stay with her, with them. I said, they'll court marshal me if, if I don't go back and catch my truck back to camp. And we were staying at the Rainbow Hotel, I'll never forget it. So uh, I said, I ain't the hell, I'm gonna get back to the Rainbow Hotel. We, I know we'd changed, we rode the subway to her house. I know I'd, we'd changed twice. I said, no, ma'am, I got to go. Uh, next time I'm up this way, I'll check with you, or whatever. And later on, I was back in Paris. That's where I had my last operation. Uh, but I didn't see her. Yeah. I asked a couple of MPs how to get to the Rainbow Hotel, and they told me what subway to take. And I got back all right. And so 
So time I got back to camp, it breaks the last German breakthrough. The art camp was coming through the Ardeen Forest. They had 20 divisions of Army soldiers and 250 tanks. They went through our front line, that's a 106, 106 division. They were the new division, they went right on through them and killed most of the men, or a lot of them. And they had called us about four o'clock in the morning to get on all your equipment, all get what equipment you got, and, and they put us on trucks and carry us a baston, put us out, and then we then I shrunk us out in a circle around the town, and we, we dug in. We knew the Germans, were, they were coming through the Ardeen Forest. Was, the, was there snow all over the ground? Huh? Was there snow all over the ground? Oh, yeah. And it was hard to even dig a foxhole and maybe take us grenade or something thought on Once you got down about four or five inches, you know, it, it was not frozen. Yeah, the ground was frozen. So did you have did you have winter gear? Did you have good winter gear or huh? did you have winter clothing? Like the clothing was it winter? I had good clothing because I was since I was a, one of the first I went to Paris, I got when I got back to camp I got real supplied right away, but we had a lot of a lot of the men was in Paris on leave, and they didn't. Yeah, I had boots. They even had to go to the losses and all that. On. They said put on all the clothes you got, you know, your, your, your underwear and then your dress clothes and then put your combat outfit over that. And then, you know, you even had a raincoat. I did, I said. And we... Stop the Germans naturally. They went around us like you throw a rock in the water in the water. Yeah. They were going on to Brussels, I believe it was, to try to capture, to get some big oil refiners down there, gasoline. They get gasoline, so they had 250 tanks. But we stopped them, but like I said, they went right around us. They played music to us and talked to us on the loudspeaker trying to get us surrounded by the battalion commander, our division commander, was in Washington, Taylor. But his assistant was in charge and he told him nuts and so that's, that's where we, so, so we, we didn't, we didn't surround enough. So you, you're, you're around Bastogne, you're all dug in. You know, how far away are the foxholes between each other? You know, well, is it probably 10 uh, feet? Uh, about 50, uh, 40, 50 yards. Wow. So you were spread thin. Yeah. Two, usually two men to the foxhole. Sometimes it may be to have three, but most time it's just two. And We had no way to knock out a tank except every once in a while we had a bazooka. But I don't think the Germans must not knew it for if they had to come through with them tanks, they had to wipe the small out. So what was the combat like? You're in the foxhole, are they shelling you? Are they yeah. artillery and do the infantry come in? The infantry tried to you know, shoot you and hit you, but we want you once you're in a foxhole, you in defense, and you, you, it's hard, like I say a while ago, it's, it's hard to get you out. You see, on the offense, you up moving, and they pick you off right away. So you just sit there for ticket at night, and, and most in the day, they were, they were shelling you all, all, all through the day. And uh, 
after we moved up a little bit, we were in the Ardeen Forest, and this, the shell was hitting the trees and they exploding, and you, the trap would be coming right down. Sonny boys put covers over their holes, but that was a bad thing to do. For you, you couldn't. The, 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 the patrols would come through at night. In fact, I, men, there's two guys, no, one guy, no, I had, I had two guys now. Captured, I don't know. One night we captured two, per, two patrols. There's four men, I think four men and each German, and so they were young soldiers and they they wasn't, wouldn't fight much with it. We didn't have shooting none of them. We just captured and took the Fed a couple on, yeah, we didn't, these boys didn't want to feed them. I said, well, they, they got to eat too, let's, let's feed them. We, but we didn't, I didn't make them go back and bring our, some, some food or some soup or something from the back, whatever, cooking, and bring it up back to them, and I, and I made sure they got some, they, and they did. Then I sent them back to the, told them to go that way, and somebody will guide you where to go, so. Hmm. They were, they, they wasn't over. <clears throat> yeah, so, so. 15 to 16 years old, I'm sure. Yeah, so the, the German infantry would be attacking, and how close would they get to your foxhole? It was called, the, well, it was wooded or not. If it, if it was wooded like that, they'd probably get close to the dam, you know. But, <clears throat> Most of them was using shell, uh, the, the tanks were firing shell. Because <clears throat> a tank don't want to fire a shell that you did a one, one man or something. He'll fire it at a building or something. But, uh, of course, they got the tanks, you know, had machine guns on, on them too, or some guns. Uh, but at night, they would. Yeah, but that's the reason we, we captured uh, uh, so many. You know, they'd, they'd come, they'd come right, right on, to, right in, in, in on you, and we'd shoot some on, and some on would come on through, or would make it through. Hmm. But that was a. Uh, I never was bothered about a, a soldier. I, I was worried about a tank, you know. If, uh, yeah. He'd come along now in the tank and he'd just drop a grenade down in your foxhole and that was it. Be yeah. over. So, can you tell me about you getting wounded? Can you talk about that story, getting wounded in Holland? No, I didn't, didn't wound him until after we, we left Holland, went to Bastogne, left Bastogne and went to France. The war was... By the way, and and, and Baston, Patton broke through to us when we were surrounded. We couldn't get in or out, or the German couldn't get it. The Germans in there couldn't get out because they couldn't get through the lines. The uh, Patton finally broke through to us with with his tanks, and after about a week. They moved us down into France, where it was, wasn't, wasn't much going on except that they put us on an outpost out in front of the of a headquarters. And there was an old, old mill that it, one time it ground the feed, your corn, or what kind of beans they had. And it, Boy, fell on myself with standing guard about one o'clock in the morning. I heard this German gun fired. It was across the Rhine River. We was on the, the French side, and they was in over in Germany. Uh, so we was going to cross the Rhine River, and, and after they got a bridge built or whatever, uh, this. 
men that were specialized in building bridges, pontoon bridges or something they call them here. I heard this shell coming in and I, I knew it was 88 for the, the five men and bang, they went right, almost straight. They went. I thought it was going to hit real close, and I hit the ground. I told fellow, I said, I must be getting shell shot. I said, damn, I, that shell came over us 100 yards. <clears throat> he, he didn't send him. We were not, we were, he and I were just standing outside this old mill, didn't have no protection at all. I heard the gun fire again. That damn shell coming by, right, probably landing close to me to that truck, a little closer. And five pieces of shrapnel went into me, and Fennel was standing to my other side, to opposite. Didn't, didn't touch him. I got two pieces in the back, one in this arm, one in the other arm, and one in the leg. The minutes, that article said the fellow took me inside the building without, I, 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 I don't know how I walked and how I crawled and how whatever. The minute came in, shot him off aim, but I was having a hard time breathing. Just two pieces in the back, but I wasn't spitting up no blood, so I said, well, you know, we sure your lungs did not puncture it, although we don't find. I thought there probably was. So they sent, they called for medics. They generally send four medics to bring a wounded person in, you know, out of, out of the altar battlefield. I only sent two, and they were young boys. They wasn't, of course, I didn't weigh about 150 pounds, so they didn't have a hell of a lot, you know, no big weight to care. By the way, I weighed 155, now I weigh 150. <laughs> I can't say that. <laughs> 17, 17 years ago, I weighed 155. Well, if, you, if you've been all the work, well, so <clears throat> they're going to take me into the ambulance. So <clears throat> she was coming in pretty regularly. One of the boys got sick when we got this little stream and put me down. He was vomiting. And I guess the blood he saw coming out of me made him, probably made him a little sick. Uh, I got up, I said, I can make it. And I, could, I couldn't walk, I was hurting. So I lay back down and he he finally got all right and they picked me up and carried me over and there was, was ambulance waiting. They took me to the ambulance and took me to a kind of a field hospital, you know, where they kind of quick saw you or whatever. And the doctors looked at me and I asked them what was they going to do. I can't remember. They didn't say nothing, of course. So they gave me more, or gave me something, knocked me out. I woke up a couple of hours later in, a, in another hospital. And this, <clears throat> this woman, the nurse said, we, we're going to transfer her to a bigger hospital with his wounds. Said, and I was in bed with no clothes on at all, not even shorts. She said, we're going to put you on the train. I said, you mean to tell me I, I got no clothes? <laughs> <laughs> she said, I can't itch you in the clothes. I, she said, I gotta keep keep account of what what, I, what we have. Just local local people. I can't. You tra you transferring out of here. I said, you mean you gonna put me on a stretcher and, a, and a, on a train with no clothes on? I said, hell no, you not. <laughs> Remember that word very well. Tell me, she come up with some clothes. With pajama and a house coat and no shoes or whatever. I rode a train for two or three hours and we stopped in Paris. It was a big general hospital. 
what happened, this, this hospital I left couldn't, couldn't figure out. I had feeling in my fingers, but I couldn't open them. They were just like that for this motor nerve, I call it motor nerve, but it's no, that, nothing else was cut. I, since they said we're going to send you to England, but the train stopped in Paris and we spent the night at this hospital and this, this specialist come by and said, I looked at your record, Fox, and I think I know what your problem is. Said, I'm going to operate, probably operate tomorrow. I said to myself, the hell, you say, now I'm, I was going to get to go to England and I'd just come out of combat. I've been, I've been in combat about four and a half months. And I was going to England where, you know, I would be out, be safe at least. So they operated on me and when I woke up, he told me that what they found. This, I think one of the large pistols went in my elbow and went into the muscle and it didn't cut the nerve, but it cut the channel it was working, it was running in. He said it was full of blood and clotted all up. He cut my arm open from about that to the, about a foot. Wow, well, he was, pulled, he was a, a, a neurology, he was a specialist. He said, I clean it out and put some silk around it and sewed it back up. She said, it's going to take a while for it to get well, but you'll be all right. She said, I'm going to still send you to England. So that made me happy. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to England and made a brace to hold my, hold my fingers up. They, they don't open now, but part of that is rheumatism. I hmm. can't open them now, no problem. Mm -hmm. But I, I still got grip in it. I stayed in England about... Two months, and they didn't do nothing but just give me in the morning just physical therapy. And, and this nurse came out after a couple months and fought you going home to get you get your stuff together. So we're gonna take you to the airport. And I got thinking, I said, the airport. I figured, you know, most, most you were transferred over, overseas and ship both ways. So sure enough, they came to the airport, and it was a really severe, well, you might, it was a four-engine plane, but it, it, it was prop planes back then. I don't remember. B-25 or huh? a B-25? I don't remember. That sound maybe right. And we had a few pieces even strapped, hung down from the, the roof on stretches. But I was walking pieces, so. And while I got got that plane, I don't know. I, I would have walked pieces. I figured I'd come back home by ship. But we left England and we stopped Ireland and Switzerland. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. I know we had to make two stops for fuel. Probably the Azores. I, I I was thinking it was well. I don't it don't matter. But, of course, you know every when we stopped, I could go down the Red Cross and you know, I could walk and then but it took about an hour for them to refill and and, and then we come out come on in New York after the second stop and. Uh, so I stayed there a few days, and they, then they sent me down to Richmond, Virginia. And that's where I, I think I got the longest furlough here. I got a 90-day furlough, three months. And I was still getting jump pay, so I had, I had and I had some money coming, coming to me. I'd been in the hospital. I spent 252 days in Army Hospital. And when I came home, I, 
I had enough money to buy me old 37 Ford, I believe it was, for $300. <laughs> and I had $300 on the cash. I paid more from uh, Mr. Hyde in Leesville. J.T. Hyde's papa. And, uh, uh, so after three months at home, I said, uh, I was going and going with a couple of gals. I wired for extension. I got another 15 day extension. So I had three and almost four months. <laughs> I went back and the doctor examined me again. He said, well, you, you're done fine. I said, no, nah, but you, you are unfit for military service, service which will you on account of that arm. Will you accept percentage? Well, I don't mind, it was 40% for discharge. Yeah, I'll accept 10%. <laughs> well, I was ready to get out of service. <laughs> they discharged me from Richmond, Virginia, mm. from, from the service. Well, and I, I used to go down to the Fort Jackson Hospital every six months for me. And after uh, five or six, seven years or whatever, they turned the Fort. Ja they turned me loose from the hospital. Say, well, if you don't have no other problems that uh, it, we're going to turn you loose. So they did. But here a while back, my, my wife got all hammers and she was in such a, no, oh yeah, they, they were ever going to call me for resentment, maybe for uh, Increase in my disability. My wife was so sick I wouldn't leave her. I'd, I'd, I'd cancel the, the policy, the, the appointment. So, hey, they, uh, and she, Well, I didn't. I didn't want to leave my wife. She was. She was mm -hmm. such a. I was married 71 years wow. to one woman. And so I. And she didn't want to go to a rest home, and I promised I wouldn't. I. I, I had checked on five rest homes for. I figured I'd die a long time before her, so she'd have somewhere to go. But the boy, two boys, we, uh, they were, they live in Clemson. They got their own. But lo and behold, in, a, in about a year's time, she she passed away. She that that particular day, I had a there was a nurse, home nurse, here with her. And I'd went up town to, I believe, went to the drugstore to get get her some medicine. Time I came in the back door, and that nurse said, "Your wife is dying." Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I never forget. I went around, and she had a mouth. I closed her mouth, and her eyes were already closed. I kissed her, and put my hand on her chest. Within a minute. Her heart stopped beating. And she died right there mm. in the house. And I was... <clears throat> so uh, I've been living here by myself for about a year and a half. Mm. It gets lonely, but thank God that he, he, he left me. Like I said, the German tried to kill me, and the Chinese is trying to kill me. I said, "You, you are not ready for me, so I'm still here." And, and by God's help, I'm that's right. There. That's right. And, uh, yes. The people from the church I attend. Thank you, uh, Sharon. Uh, Almost every week, they 
somehow bring me some food. Or I got got one man that drives me sometimes where I need to go, but I, I still drive. I'm I'm 90, 96 years old, hmm. but I still drive and cut my grass and <laughs> wash amazing. dishes and out amazing. Yeah, the place looks great. <laughs> yes. huh? It looks great out here. Yeah, <laughs> looks good. Thank you. Well, but well, um, Mr. Ray, we we appreciate your service and thank well, you for taking some time well, to talk to us. Thank, thank it means you, a lot. Thank you very much. Yes, sir.